thank you for joining me for Now Go Build. This is a series where we're meeting passionate startup founders from around the world and get to hear what their challenges are in building their business and really connecting with their passionate customers. I'm very fortunate to be able to travel all across the world and meet these startups. And I will take you on that ride with them, such as you can see what the different challenges are around the world. All of them have similar stories to tell, but also very unique stories with respect to their businesses, as well as in the environment where they have to operate in. This will be a very exciting ride. Please join me. So we're here in the Netherlands today to meet two young startups, Relief and Maikujo. Maikujo, out of Amsterdam, is uh, focused on bringing football matches from around the world to all their passionate viewers. So we're here with the co-founders of Maikujo. It's great to present ourselves because we're twin brothers. <laughs> It was actually the perfect match because I, I've uh, studied communication and marketing, João studied engineering, yeah. and when we started thinking about the idea, eventually you always pitch the idea to your friends and family. Mm -hmm. This guy grabbed it right away. And football is by far the biggest entertainment industry in the world. We're speaking about approximately 450 million players around the world, so mm -hmm. mass participation. We have the biggest portfolio of football videos in the world because yeah. we have videos from uh, guys playing on the sand with light, with no lights. Usually uh, companies have uh, productions that are really high level, but then, then it's easy to recognize the actions and the moments and the people. What we have is a really great uh, uh, advantage in that sense because our machines are learning with the most varied types of <laughs> yes. production in the world. Relive from Rotterdam allows outdoor enthusiasts to track their races and then relive that through videos that are being created and that they can share online. So the idea started uh, when we were cycling with a group of friends on, uh, on Tenerife. We were all spending a lot of time in, like, also analyzing our rides and looking into, uh, into the apps and all the data that you get. And we really loved that, but we figured out something was missing. Yeah. Before Relive, it used to be like a mystery. I'd go out in my crazy cycling suit and be out for like six hours. But everything that happened in between would be a black box for my wife or my family or whatsoever. And now I have this video and everybody is all excited and I can really share, uh, share my passion for the outdoors. Yeah. It's about the having the good time with friends and family and having these great stunning views. We just want to tell the whole story and I think we really if you can tell a story to everyone. Having a brilliant idea is step one for every startup entrepreneur. But ideas are not companies. If you want to build a company and a lasting business, you got to make money somehow. Right now our focus is very much based on the advertisement, the B2B mm -hmm. model. So we don't spend a single euro in production, otherwise we would not be scalable. So we develop software in the clouds that empowers clubs, leagues and federations to stream content. And in the end, the easiest way to make money was, okay, it's long tail content, we're not going to have a lot of users, so we're charging a service to the clubs, leagues and federations. Right. We started there, but we knew since the beginning that we needed to build a scalable business model. So when we charge the service, we always add the variable business model in the contract saying, okay, you pay us, but then we'll make money through advertising and sponsorship when we uh, reach the, the end consumer, and then we have a split of the revenues. Relief is free, so everybody can uh, get the app and get started. We found it the most important that everyone can share their passion for the outdoors and that they don't have to pay for that. And so lately we've been uh, doing some experiments with, uh, with a premium version of our app. Okay. Uh, and that's uh, the, the business model we're exploring right now. How fast have you grown? How many users do you have? I mean, how many users of that first prototype were there? Yeah, we shared this uh, pretty much two years ago, and we started sharing it uh, to our own friends to see, okay, would they uh, share their videos on, f on Facebook or would they share their videos on WhatsApp with others. Within a couple of weeks, we grew to like 10,000 users. And that same summer, uh, we were at 50,000 users, including pro riders in the Tour de France picking it up. So, and that's when it got really exciting for us. So now we are at 2 million users. So, okay. and that's uh, within two years. Uh, we're working now with appro approximately 70 football federations across the world. 
We've broadcasted content of around 3,000 football clubs as well. And nowadays, our clients are uh, the federations, the leagues, and the clubs. But uh, we want to go all the way to the players, and we want them to start registering the platform and interacting with, with us. In 2015, we broadcasted 56 games. In 2016, we broadcasted uh, 1,086 live matches. And this year, we expect to broadcast uh, uh, 20,000 live matches in the platform. So our biggest objective is by 2022 to have 2 billion people uh, coming to our platform. You were in Norway, you were in Turkey. <laughs> Why did you end up in Amsterdam? Amsterdam has everything you need, right? Everyone is super nice, and uh, and uh, not because uh, you're from here. Or <laughs> that. It's really true, and, and also like uh, um, everyone speaks fluently in English. I was born and raised in the Netherlands. I studied computer science here, but this wasn't always a place to build a tech company. That has changed. Today, there's technical talent and a burgeoning startup culture. And that's why these two companies have chosen to be here. So you guys are in Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular reason for being here? It's very convenient that we're very close to the station. It's a, there's a lot of happening in the city. We're actually based in an area where we have a lot of startups around us. So that's very interesting, the good vibes. Did you find it easy to find engineers, for example, to come and work for startups? Because that hmm. used to be a big challenge in the Netherlands. So yeah, yeah. It's a, I think it's, uh, it it still is, and I think it's still a challenge like uh, everywhere. Uh, what helps really is, I think, we have a lot of uh, like a lot of of our own users who are writing in like, hey, uh, this sounds like a great company to work for, and it's actually there's it also an amazing opportunity to build something. I think that's the biggest challenge for a startup, right? Um, when you start a company, you have very low resources in terms of, of uh, money, while well, being direct to the point. And like the hardest thing is like finding people to work for you is almost as pitching for an investment, right? Because you have to find the right talent, but you don't have the resources to pay to the top people, right? And these top people, of course, are in the best companies uh, earning uh, enough salaries that it's very competitive, right? Do you see yourself sort of maybe one, one day moving out of the Netherlands or oh, yeah. do you guys still focus, <laughs> really focus on staying here? Well, I think that's the great thing about the internet is that you can have your company everywhere. And, and of course, I would love to have several offices all over the world, one in Tahoe, <laughs> uh, maybe one uh, in the Alps. Like, okay. That would be perfect. <laughs> My Cujo and we live were both built to serve the needs of their passionate users. They have that in common. What they also share are the challenges of building something new. So I brought them together for a little group therapy about the obstacles that they and every startup face. Has this sort of culture changed? Or do you need to go outside of the Netherlands to get your engineers? Yeah, it is a risk, but it's, it's a very safe risk because you're going to do or you're going to follow your dream and you're going to follow something or do something that you love, right? Mm -hmm. And in the end, what can go wrong, right? And, and um, it's, it's a lot of things. <laughs> no, yeah, that, that's the question. Yeah. I agree. But what would be life also without this experience, right? And, well, you guys gave up your jobs as well. Yeah, right? so, so for me, it was... Uh, well, I, I, I remember when we started, we had like a couple thousand users and I think... At one point we mentioned, whoa, imagine if we could ever build a company out of this, like, yeah, ooh, wow. But then later on, at one point, we had so many users and people were really, really using Relief all around the world. And at that point, it was a no-brainer for me to quit my day job and uh, start doing this. But, but do you feel that that is a, a sentiment that has changed in society to make it more acceptable to these, these days? Well, you see more, more and often, I think you see, like I think there have never been so many startups as there have been right now. And even in the Netherlands, you see it everywhere. Every big city has a startup, uh, like incubators, uh, co-working spaces. There's much more and more funding and support around it because it also develops economies, right? And micro, micro businesses and medium, small. And an economy normally is built of small and medium-sized businesses. And the more mm -hmm. you have as well, the more jobs you create. So I think that's, that's the kind of opportunity that Europe is also trying to look into, right? And you see all these towns around Europe, like Barcelona, Lisbon, Amsterdam, London, they are creating great hubs because of that, right? And <laughs> young people before would face a lot of unemployment, but young people now are creating their own jobs and creating yeah. their own yeah. Yeah, opportunities, right? We are yeah. becoming a society run by, by technology, right? So like it's becoming an, an everyday thing for everybody. Everybody yeah. has like a cell phone, everybody has like internet connectivity on the, on the go, and they they, they want to tap into that, so they un unleash this creativity in people like, like never before. One idea that carried us through the early days of building Amazon is something every startup founder can relate to. It is captured in a quote from Jeff Bezos. 
If you're going to do anything new or innovative, you have to be willing to be misunderstood for a long period of time. I would like to focus on failure again because for us failure meant like we're doing something against what was traditional, right? And for us it gave us only more motivation to continue doing it because we knew that it was so traditional in the industry that we were and it still is the sports, all of us, both of us are working in the sports industry. So anything that we do around digital is still very conservative, but do you feel a difference like between uh, then when you join Amazon and nowadays or it's exactly the same but at a different no. scale or? Uh... Well, I mean, look at the early days of AWS. Yeah. Um, who would ever want to buy a server from a bookshop? Yeah. 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 I mean, that was clear. That was not something that sort of someone made up. No, it's actually sort of the the existing IT providers had a, a massive fear, uncertainty, and doubt strategy against AWS. Mm -hmm. But you know, at the same time, we have a strong belief that if we don't continue to move fast and innovate really fast, we'll be out of business in 10 to 15 years. That's nice. And not because there's another large Amazon coming. It will be death by a thousand cuts. Right. Someone will be doing shoes better. Someone will be doing diapers better. Someone, eh, so, and customers have access to perfect information. Yeah. They know exactly where they can get the best deal or the best convenience or the best trusted uh, 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 seller. And, and as such, if you don't continue to innovate in, in our digital world, we'll be out of business. I really, I really love that anal analogy because at the same time, it's uh, that you're saying, okay, these razor thin margins uh, force you to innovate because that's very similar to yeah. what startups have. I mean, they, 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 you can be dead within 12 months. And as such, for Amazon, it is moving fast is more important than many of the other uh, cool. metrics that you would have as a business. But if, if so we allow duplication to happen. We allow sort of decentralization where teams are not coordinated. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and sort of mostly because those structures allow you to move fast. Exactly. Yeah, because if you have to coordinate a company where you have 800 or 1,000 decentralized teams, it's not going to happen. Yeah, because then you have to put hierarchy on top of that to get that done, and that will inhibit innovation. Why? Because it's not natural. Hierarchies are not yeah, natural. They are not. Yeah? Now, in nature, there's a head monkey and all the other monkeys. <laughs> yeah? There's no lieutenant monkey yeah. Yeah? <laughs> this is, or anything uh -huh. like, like that. And as such, if you want to build a natural, fast-moving organization, you need to remove these kind of structures. Yeah. Every engineer needs to become a security engineer. For us, data is what drives the future of our business. Data has a lot of um, uh, points in our company, starting with the way we develop our company, right, and the product is very much on, based on the data that we collect both from our partners but as well from the content uh, consumers. But then uh, it's the data around the match and all of this has value, right? So every moment that every player around the world from Bhutan to Brazil are right now playing and having a video connected to every action that they're having, right? So data is like everything. And then, of course, the data protection side of the, the, the rights that we're speaking. What can we do as a, like an industry and particularly as, as software engineers also? We should take responsibility mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, for the systems that yeah. we, we build. You know, if you don't protect your customers and if you don't protect your critical business data, you have no business. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's as easy as that. I'm convinced that every engineer needs to become a security engineer. Also, it comes with awareness that it's our responsibility to keep your customers safe. Yeah. yeah? I mean, that's, that's, like that's just important. number one. Yeah. Uh, and because without that, you won't have a business in the future. Yeah. Do you think this, the whole awareness of this, is this going in the right direction or is it like going too slow? So. Personally, I think the kind of uh, things that we've seen in the past four or five years in terms of data breaches, mm -hmm. I think it's embarrassing. Yeah, this, uh, yeah. Because not only not because what happened and how simple many of these attacks were, mm -hmm. but the fact that we've become so jaded that we think it's okay, right. or that it's normal, and it's not. If you're a credit scoring company and you lose, what is it, social security numbers of 180,000, yeah, 180 yeah, million people, it's not okay. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, because it might be, especially if it's payment information, yeah. it might be easier to actually go back to your customer and say, <laughs> sorry, we deleted your credit card because we felt we were under attack and we rather delete it and ask you for a new one. Yeah. yeah? And so you have to change your mindset in that sort of protecting your customers goes before anything. So you guys have been growing really fast, both of you. Yeah, and so there's all these new dimensions that come into your business. So sometimes stuff must break. <laughs> yeah, because you didn't anticipate that. You know I mean, it's hard enough to build things that are either super reliable or where your features don't break. So how do you guys deal with um, stuff breaking? 
Yeah, also in the beginning, we couldn't keep up with the growth. Like, uh, like sometimes stuff breaks, so we have uh, we have people that had to wait like for 30 hours for their to get their video. We tried to improve that. We used to run it on USS old computer, like smoke coming out, <laughs> uh, especially during the weekends when it was night nice weather. You knew that was like is the queues were going to be huge. It's nice for a user, right? So a little bit of anticipation. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when does it? And I, I remember Yusuf actually. Deleting the database. Uh, that was <laughs> nice. That was fun. This was like on the first. Uh, first Humans day, are not really reliable, are yeah. they? <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually one of the. Uh, it was on the first day of our our new employee. So he was like, like "What the?" Yeah. <laughs> new backend engineer joining, and I issued like a delete delete from a user or something. Drop yeah, all like tables. That, that was, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But I still remember the days like uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, where it would be like the on-call rotation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just one person, and then, uh, oh, something doesn't work. And then it's like, uh, I don't know, three o'clock in the night because some match in, uh, in Singapore is happening, you know. And, uh, the, hard, the hardest is probably to have stress, stress handle uh, these yeah. situations. And, yeah. <laughs> and for us, it's, um, it's been quite stressful, a lot of white hairs uh, yeah. in the beginning. I've We've always seen our AWS customers as builders. Yeah, and so I think you guys are great examples uh, of, of that, uh, building great, great products. So thank you for being here and um, go build. Thank, Thank, you very very much. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. In our next episode, we will meet some builders in Indonesia using blockchain and big data to have social impact.